learning objectives describe the different types of chest pain. Um, there's lots of different types. Q, discuss the pathophysiology of why we have acute coronary syndromes. Then discuss the treatment and prevention of acute coronary syndromes as well. All right, first thing is the different types of chest pain syndromes. Right. Probably the first and most critical step is the history that you take from the patient and figuring out what kind of chest pain this patient has. You can have acute coronary syndrome, which we're going to talk about. And the biggest one is what we call a ST elevation myocardial infarction or a STEMI. And that's based on the EKG. Usually if you have ST elevation, that means the artery is totally closed and you want to try to get that artery back open. The other types of ACS are what we call non-ST elevation myocardial infarction. And that's where the EKG does not show ST elevation, but the patient is having some type of damage to their heart. And the other thing is what we call unstable angina or USA, which means there's waxing and waning chest pain um, that the patient is experiencing. The other kind of chest pain is stable angina. There's a person that has a fixed coronary lesion, gets chest pain at walking one block or walking one kilometer or walking for 10 minutes. It's kind of a stable set um, progression of chest pain. The other type of chest pain, which is very common, is atypical chest pain. And is this one you're kind of, you have to figure out, am I worried? Do I have to do anything about this chest pain? The final chest pain that we don't have to worry about is non-cardiac chest pain. It is important. We're going to have to treat it, diagnose it, but that's not going to be part of what we're going to talk about today. All right. So there's a nice graph or table talking about acute coronary syndrome, likelihood, based, based on the history, the examination, the EKG, and biomarkers. So if you look at here, here's history, examination, EKG, and biomarkers like troponins or CKs. Now high likelihood in the history is going to be typical chest pain, left chest, left arm, gets worse with exertion, gets better with rest. All right. Examination typically is not that helpful on any of them, but typically if you have mitral regurgitation murmur, low blood pressure, rails in the lungs, that's more likely to be a cardiac cause. EKG, obviously if you have EKG changes, then that's going to make it more likely to be acute coronary syndrome. And finally, if you have abnormal troponins or CKs um, in the lab work, that already means you probably have some cardiac damage and that's much more likely to be acute coronary syndrome. Um, then there's intermediate likelihood and low likelihood, and that's where things get more and more atypical, less likely. And as you can tell here, the biomarkers are normal. EKGs are not that diagnostic, just have some minor changes. Um, but this is mostly determined by how you look at the history. Then there's a whole bunch of things that are non-cardiac chest pain. Um, some of the real common things uh, is GI, like ulcer disease, reflux, heartburn, which often mimics or feels or sounds like um, chest uh, or heart pain. The other big one is chest wall pain. This happens all the time where there's sore ribs, sore muscles, run right the area of your heart, and that makes people really, really worried that it is their heart, but it's just that costochondritis inflammation of the chest wall. Now, this is really important. Um, a lot of times people have acute, acute coronary syndrome by what we call plaque rupture, which we're gonna talk about in a little bit, and that's where you have a lesion, it gets abraded, and then platelets stick to it, and then a lesion goes from 30% to 50 to 70, or even to 100%, causing a heart attack. Now, not all the time is that the factor. A lot of times you'll have a 50% blockage, and you'll get chest pain because of these secondary factors, like increased oxygen demand. If you're having a fever, high heart rate, high blood pressure, these are things that cause more um, oxygen demand and cause your heart to be ischemic. Also, you can have decreased supply if you're anemic, hypoxic, and hypoxia can be from pneumonia, asthma, many different things, uh, collapsed lung, pneumothorax, all these things make decreased oxygen, decreased blood supply. Sickle cell disease, um, all these things will cause you to have less oxygen and make your heart ischemic. All right, now we're gonna talk about some of the real basic pathophysiology of acute coronary syndrome. All right, so this is a great graph. This talks about 
from the presentation, the working diagnosis, EKG, biomarkers, and your final diagnosis. When people come in complaining of chest pain, unless we know it's non-cardiac, we're going to be worried that it may be possibly acute coronary syndrome. So now we're at this point. Then what happens if you look at EKG is there's ST elevation. That means the heart, there's, as you can see here, there's a plaque here, it ruptured, platelets formed here. The whole artery is 100% blocked. You have ST elevation, and you're going to have a heart attack or a myocardial infarction. Here on the EKG, there's no ST elevation, but if your biomarkers are negative, then you have unstable angina. If you have a non-ST MI, your biomarkers are positive or elevated, just, just the EKG did not show ST elevation. This next uh, graph is going to be the really important one. So if you look here, this is the artery cut in cross section looking at you. This is what we call the cholesterol or the plaque, the blockage, and this is about a 50% stenosis. There's a fibrous cap and here's blood flow in the lumen. What happens is we have what we call plaque disruption or plaque rupture, and there is a broken part of the plaque. Play, it's like the stick on here, and then you thrombose part of it, and also your body is trying to break that down and thrombolysing at the same time. And depending on the relative uh, levels, you can uh, maintain 50% blockage, or you can come down here and basically have 100% totally blocked artery, and then you're gonna have a heart attack. Now also, there's two things gonna happen here. You can heal, and you went from 50% down to now you have about a 60% stenosis, or here you can have go from 50% up here, and you can be down to just very small holes that are left, and this is like really a 99% stenosis at this point. Very little blood can get through that stenosis. So acute coronary syndrome is classified by a rapid change in blood supply, change in the angial pattern. Patients get chest pain with less activity, more frequency, and it's usually more severe. And if you have a really, really tight stenosis, that means you can have pain when you're sitting down in a chair doing nothing. And that's what we call rest pain or rest angina. Now, what's also interesting is when we do angiography or we look at uh, autopsies, what we find is that these really, really bad lesions are very infrequent. Frequency of plaques. What's much more frequent are the 30s and the 50% blockages. Okay, These um, tight ones cause more symptoms. They cause more chest pain. But these are the ones that actually are more dangerous. These are ones that cause the un acute coronary syndrome, unstable angina, and uh, myocardial infarctions. There's a really interesting study where they looked at people that actually had two angiograms. They came in one time, they got an angiogram, looked at their arteries, then they came back in a heart attack, and they got another angiogram, looked at their arteries. And what's very interesting is they found that the stenosis that led to the MI, about 70% were not high grade. They're only less than 50%. So we're gonna go back here. You have a 50% stenosis. These are the ones that break and lead to having acute coronary syndrome. So these right here are the ones where the plaque will rupture, platelets stick to it, and they'll go from 50% to 90% or 100% and cause the problems. These ones are much more stable and usually don't cause un unstable angina and acute coronary syndrome. Yeah. Now, um, I, don't, I don't think you guys do a lot of angiography there, but this is an example. Angiography is not perfect. If you look, this is um, dye in the cor person's coronary artery. And what you can tell at every level, there's much more blockage than you think. On, this is an IVUS. Uh, this is an intervascular ultrasound called IVUS. And what you can see is the arteries are much worse off than what this dye looks like. I'm going to skip that here. What's interesting is atherosclerosis begins at a very early age. This is a really famous study called the Korean War study. So they looked at autopsies from American soldiers that fought in the Korean War, average age, 22 years old. And what they found is 77% of these 22-year-old kids had blockages in their arteries. Almost 40%, though, had 100% occlusions in some of the arteries. So heart disease starts at a very early age. Now, what's even more interesting is it starts even before that. 
So this is some studies done on patients that have act, um, kids that had that were um, not therapeutic but miscarriages and abortions, and they looked at the arteries in the kids. And what they found is even as a fetus, that you're already having fatty streaks and blockages build up, even while you're in utero, while you're inside your mom um, in the womb. So heart disease starts at an incredibly early age. And then we'll skip this for time here. And why this is important is you talk about when you're a fetus, you have these early fatty streaks. The more fatty streaks you have, probably you're on a faster track to get more heart disease, atheromas, plaque rupture, stenosis as you get older. We don't know this for sure, but a lot of the data is showing that now. The earlier you have risk factors like diabetes, high blood pressure, and start smoking, the more likely you're gonna get blockages in your arteries and have problems. All right, now we're getting to the treatment of acute coronary syndrome. All right, so the initial evaluation, this is a picture of um, me back at the University of Cincinnati, and we're all looking at all the echoes and nuclear tests, all the fancy tests, but that's not the important part. Really, the evaluation starts at the bedside. It's not about ordering a bunch of tests. Got to take the history, got to do a physical exam. History is the most important thing. Physical exam is supportive. Getting the EKG is really helpful. And finally, the last thing is really getting CKs or troponins, looking at the labs. All right, now let's talk about stable angina, then we'll go back to acute coronary syndrome. So this is an angiogram showing a real high grade, this is about almost a subtotaled artery, 99% stenosis. And stable angina basically is a fixed stenosis, it's always 99%, fixed supply, ischemia is fixed, I walk five minutes, this person gets chest pain. I go one flight of stairs, gets chest pain, et cetera. All right, it's effort, it's very predictable how to get the angina. All right, now the characteristics of the chest pain are very important. So this is from Diamond and Forrester, a really famous study. They looked at men and women and different ages here, and depending on if it was non-angial chest pain, atypical, or very typical sounding chest pain, they can tell how likely, what percentage you would um, have blocked up arteries when they did the heart cath. So the history is very important. So if you have a 60 year old male with typical sounding history, the odds of them having a blocked up artery is 94%. So history is better than even a stress test. Same thing for women, older women, typical sounding chest pain, 86% likely of having a blocked up artery. That's actually better than a stress test. Now, what you can also tell down here is non angelo chest pain, even though they have really bad sounding stories for chest pain, even some of these people will have blocked up arteries, but it's very low. Now, you can also grade angina or chest pain, and this is the Canadian classification score for angina, and this is actually really good. One is like most of us, I hope, um, no chest pain, can do whatever you want to do. Number two is you get chest pain, but you got to walk over two blocks or one flight of stairs. That brings on the chest pain. Three is you get chest pain at less than one flight of stairs or less than two blocks. Class four means basically you get chest pain in doing um, activities, like living, walking around your house, carrying groceries, stuff like that. So you can say, you can say like, I get chest pain, class three, which is pretty severe chest pain, class two, not so bad, class four, definitely gonna have to do something. All right. The exam is also very important too. So there's something called the Killup classification when people come in with heart attacks or um, acute coronary syndrome, and it predicts mortality. And these are the four stages of the Killup classification. One is normal exam. No gallops, no neck vein distension, normal lung exam, no edema. Killip class two um, is you have bivasilar crackles or you have an S3 gallop on heart exam. Three is you have pulmonary edema crackles everywhere in your lung exam. Four is you're in shock, which means you have a low blood pressure. Now, if you look at this graph, you can tell this is the mortality or survival. People with class one do great. People in class two 
10% mortality, even at 30 days. People of class three or four kilo, they have about a 15, 20% mortality within the first month. So the exam can help stratify how sick these guys are gonna be, what you gotta do with them. And what's interesting is they looked at um, 30 day mortality and six month mortality in a bunch of modern uh, randomized controlled trials. Killip published this in 1976, but it's still relevant in the 2000s. So depending on your Killip class, you can see an increase in mortality, increase in mortality, increase in mortality at 30 days and six months on a higher or worse Killip score. Now, EKG changes are also um, prognostically bad. If your EKG is normal, basically you have very low event rate or very low death rate or heart attack rate. The more you have, I'm sorry, you get T wave changes, ST changes, or ST elevation and depression, then you have a much more likely or high likelihood of having a heart attack or dying from this event. Now the problem is you have to decide what you're gonna do before you get the labs back. Now this is a graph that shows the um, changing of biomarkers, CK and troponins, and this is hours, whoop, hours after the heart attack. And what you can see is even troponin doesn't peak until about eight or 10 hours after the heart attack. So you have to make a decision, like I think this is a really heart pain, treat that pain, put the person you know, in the hospital and watch them, before you get the labs back. If the labs come back abnormal, that means they already had a heart attack. But a lot of what we deal with is people that have symptoms of chest pain, we're not sure if we put them in the hospital because we can't just wait for all these labs to come back. So there's lots of interesting ways to look at this. One is a Timmy risk score. And I don't typically use this because it's kind of too complicated. But what's really interesting is looking at the odds of death in one month so the older you are, more likely to pass away or die. Your higher kill-up score is not good. Fast heart rate, left bundle branch block on your EKG, low blood pressure. And these are all things we kind of looked at on the kill-up classification, right? Because um, basically you're in cardiogenic shock. If you're skinnier, you've already had heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, those are things that all make you more likely to die if you're having a heart attack. The only thing that makes you less likely is if you're on a lipid lowering medication. And that's interesting because that means that's a medication that's trying to reduce cholesterol all over your body and all your vascular beds. And hopefully that's going to be why we have less uh, plaque, less blockages, and you're going to do better. Okay. So now acute medical therapy here. One is control pain. And there's a lot of good ways to do that. Nitroglycerin works great to control pain. Morphine or pain medications do a great job. And it also decreases what we call air hunger. A lot of the heart attack, acute coronary syndrome patients will have chest pain, shortness of breath, can't breathe. So morphine, um, nitroglycerin do a great job on that. And you want to decrease demand. And you decrease demand from the heart by slowing the heart rate down and decreasing the blood pressure. If they're really tachycardic, and really hypertensive, then that means there's more stress in the heart. Heart needs more oxygen, blood. It's going to do a lot worse. All right. And then any secondary causes that we talked about, besides the fast heart rate, high blood pressure, are they anemic? Give them some blood. Are they hypoxic? Give them some oxygen. What can you do to get more oxygen to the heart? And then you want to stabilize the plaque, and we'll talk about that too. So there's a couple of things. Um, to do here, they talk about supplemental oxygen, nitroglycerin, IV or oral, beta blockers, morphine, and those ones that are really available to everybody. And we typically use beta blockers first because um, they actually decrease the amount of cardiac death within the first 30 days of a heart attack. Calcium channel blockers like verapamil or deltizum, probably use that second best. There's less data on them. Don't use the abnormal a lot because it's a negative ion choke can make the heart work a little bit worse. And then we never use the first generation like Norvas, Procardia, because um, they actually make the heart rate go up, which is what we don't want to do here. Okay, so the Tizem is okay. 
So it's all about supply and demand like we talked about here. Supply is blood, oxygen, free fatty acids for fuel. And demand is the cardiac workload. And that's basically heart rate times blood pressure, which is the perfusion pressure. There's something that we call rate pressure product. And basically the rate pressure product is your heart rate times systolic blood pressure. So as we get heart rate slower, blood pressure lower, it's less of the rate pressure product and that's less stress on your heart. And this is easy to do with medications nitroglycerin, morphine, beta blockers, et cetera. Now, anticoagulation, something we want to thin the blood. Um, probably the best thing that we do or that can be done anywhere is basically aspirin. And the dose here is 325 milligrams. Chew it so it gets absorbed quickly, get into your system. Um, also, Plavix has been shown to stabilize the plaques and decrease heart attack and stroke um, early on. Heparin, there's some data that um, heparin uh, helps, but since we use aspirin so much, heparin's not that important. Then there's some like um, 2B3 receptor inhibitors, which are really expensive, um, that we don't actually, we don't even use that much anymore. And we don't worry about lytics. So there's a study called the Armada uh, study, and they looked at Plavix on top of aspirin. Yep. And what they found is basically odds ratio for micro infarction. If you have statins for cholesterol, or you give um, Plavix, it decreases the ratio of people coming in and eventually getting a heart attack. So those two strategies are, really, and we're gonna go talk about statins a lot more or cholesterol, they really reduce the risk of a heart attack. There's a bunch of studies, but we're gonna um, go over just a couple of them here. This is a Timmy 22, and they looked at a high dose of Torvastatin or Lipitor versus a regular dose Pravastatin. And the more you can get your cholesterol down early, the less major cardiac events, heart attack, stroke, or death that occur. All right. And this is right at the beginning when people are having a heart attack. And you see basically about three months, there's a big difference uh, depending on how aggressively you treat cholesterol. All right. I'm gonna skip this for a time here. All right. And what's interesting, I don't know how big a problem cholesterol is over there in America. It's a huge problem. Um, like 60% of our people are obese. About 50% have diabetes and about 30, 40% have high cholesterol. So it's a big deal. But if you look at cholesterol here, hunter gatherer tribes, primates, wild mammals, and then the modern American, this is how much our cholesterol is. And this is what's, a big driver for heart disease in America is high cholesterol and also smoking, high blood pressure. So in this study called the TNT study, they figured out that the lower you, they looked at all these different studies, but the lower you can get your total or your bad cholesterol, the LDL, the lower you can get the event rates. And that's why a lot of times now we'll try to get the LDL to below 70 um, milligrams per deciliter. And actually, we get down to about 30, the event rate is almost to zero. Now, so if you look at here in this um, study, if you get the event LDL is about 30, you can really have a big impact on the event rate for a future heart attack, stroke, or death. All right, skip that for a time. All right, so statin is really interesting. This is an IVA study where they are pulling back and looking. They are pulling back in the coronary artery, and they can tell how much plaque is seen and they can quantitate it, actually measure it. And what you see is over time, like this artery, this artery, actually there's less plaque. Same thing here, you can actually shrink the amount of cholesterol in there. And what you can see here is you can drop the bad cholesterol with Crestor or Lipitor and that increases the lumen size. It actually makes the arteries have more blood flow through them. Now, the reason this is important is um, in acute coronary syndrome, it's not just one lesion that gets disrupted or ruptured. This is a great study <clears throat> where they did IVUS, and they did IVUS of all three of your coronary arteries when you had acute coronary syndrome. And what they found is that about 80% of people had more than one ruptured plaque. So even if you could stent that plaque, you had to stent more lesions. It's not just one area that's in trouble. The whole vascular bed is inflamed and irritated and unstable. 
All right. So acute corneal syndrome leads to global vascular instability. And that's why things like aspirin, not smoking, blood pressure control, cholesterol control, diabetes control is so important because that takes care of everything, not just the area we drop stents. Now, there's another study that proves the same point. Um, this is in Japan. They did what we call angioscopy. They'll put a little camera into the coronaries and look at it. And the most important thing is they actually studied people. And basically, 55% of people at 12 months still had irritated, ruptured plaques, even after they got treated. So even 12 months later, people still need therapy. I'm going to skip. Yeah. Predictors of non-healing plaques, basically high cholesterol and really high CRP, which is a measure of inflammation. And that's C-reactive protein. All right. Do statins have any acute benefits? This has been studied a lot, and actually they do. Um, so this is a study where they actually gave a Lipitor right at the time of the heart attack. And what they found basically is the heart attack is smaller if you get a Lipitor right at the beginning. And this is just a basic science slide for fun here, but that kind of works through what we call the PI3 kinase, AKT, the ENOS, ENOS endothelial nitric oxide synthase. So this is what nitroglycerin works on. So the cholesterol medications actually make more nitric oxide in the coronary arteries, dilate the blood vessels, and that's probably why they have less heart attacks. Okay, now I wanna compare I know you guys don't do a lot of stenting over there, but comparing medications versus the stents. So a stent, basically, um, unless it's acute MI, there's really been no mortality benefit shown in tons of stent studies. It's an invasive procedure. It only treats the lesion you put a stent in. Now statins, stop smoking, blood pressure control, all medications, what they do is they have a bunch of mortality benefits. There's tons of studies that show you get a cholesterol medication, you control diabetes, you stop smoking, you control blood pressure, you live longer. It's not invasive, it's easy, you just have a patient take a pill, and it treats the whole cardiovascular, carotid, cerebrovascular, aortic vascular beds. So look at this another way. The human body's got about 40,000 kilometers of artery. A stent is about 30 millimeters on average. So when we put in one stent, we're only covering 0.000008% of the arterial system. We're not having a big impact, all right? When we stop smoking, control diabetes, lower cholesterol, control blood pressure, we're taking care of all 40,000 kilometers of artery. We're improving vascular health. All right, acute money therapy slides. So nitroglycerin or morphine for pain, beta blockers to decrease heart rate, <clears throat> heparin's okay if you have it, aspirin stabilizes the plaque, Plavix is good, statins are limited to cholesterol, is also good for stabilizing the plaques, and then we talked about before, Plavix. All right, so how do we prevent acute coronary syndrome? It's basically how we treat it. Um, you want to, even after they've had a heart attack, that person should get an aspirin go, you know, as they leave the hospital. Beta blockers, get their heart rate down, blood pressure down, control cholesterol by medications or diet, and no cigarettes. Control diet and diabetes, lose weight, blood pressure, sodium, et cetera. And then basically exercise, because that helps all your whole vascular bed as well. And what we want to really do is practice global cardiovascular medicine. And then the last lecture, we talk about lifestyle medicine. If we do those things, that has a big impact on mortality, stroke, heart attack, and preventing other events. So with the medication and diet, exercise, sleep, rest, um, makes a huge difference. Okay. So in America, I keep telling the people we have to stop focusing on stenosis and stenting things. And we have to take every opportunity to try to prevent and treat people with coronary artery disease or peripheral vascular disease and try to treat the whole vascular bed. And we do that by risk factor modification. I mean, like I keep saying, control blood pressure, control diabetes, control cholesterol, stop smoking, 
diet and exercise, and which is really best done by lifestyle modification. All right, so to kind of summarize here, classify chest pain in the correct category. Is it acute coronary syndrome? You got to worry about it. Or is it non-cardiac chest pain? You know, you have to look into it, but it's not going to be a heart attack. Don't have to worry about non-cardiac chest pain. One of the big factors is instead of memorizing all these different drugs, is you gotta control the heart rate and blood pressure. You wanna anticoagulate, and the big thing is aspirin, Plavix if you got it. All right, and the risk factor modification, and the best way to do that is lifestyle modification.